today we have a review of probably the best show of 2022, Smiling Friends. Created by Zach Hadel and Michael Cusack, Smiling Friends tells the story of Charlie Dumpler, Pim Pimling, Blep, Alan, and Mr. Mr. Boss working to help people smile through uh, the eponymous charity organization. Today we'll start out with Desmond's Big Day Out. While watching a bizarre TV show, Charlie notices Alan setting up mouse traps after his precious cheese has gone missing. Charlie and Pim are called into Mr. Boss's office, who assigns them to help a man named Desmond, who the two mistakenly believe to be a child. Desmond is actually a middle-aged man whose life has been in a tailspin. For me, my wife left me, my kids left me, my dog died from a broken heart last fall. Charlie suggests that he may be a lost cause, but Pim is determined to show Desmond a good time, first at his chaotic parents' house. <laughs> While the two are away, Alan ventures into the walls, finding a man on a computer and a single purple critter wielding a stolen paper clip, and this creature leads them to a horde of others. Next, Desmond is sent to a party where Pim is ostracized as an old man. The final stop is Daveland, where the three see multiple exhibits. When asked if he enjoyed himself, Desmond retorts that he had fun, but could not enjoy things because all the fun seems to eventually fade away. They admit defeat and head back on to the office, only to see Alan crucified with a horde of bliblies fighting among the office. Desmond shoots one, stating that it felt good, and finally lets out a smile along with a control service that promises to destroy the critters by any means. In an ironic twist, Pim is the, no, the one in a depressive state. This is by far the best way to open up the series, showing its unique mix of style of animations, humor, and a positive tone offsetting Adult Swim's more nihilistic fare. By far my favorite jokes are the ant, the TV creature, and the fact that Mr. Boss's office is just a gray void. Good stuff. <laughs> Mr. Frog. Opening with a clip of the longest running show, The Mr. Frog Show, we learn of the star's downward spiral after he swallowed a reporter for seven minutes. Charlie, a lifelong fan of the show, decides to help the actor's image after giving the go-ahead by Mr. Boss. Glep, who is noticeably absent, is auditioning to replace Mr. Frog, yet he is only given the part when he spits in the executive's face because of his raw bad boy edge. At the star's mansion, Charlie and Pim formulate a plan to introduce the Mr. Frog at a book signing, made moot when he chokes out a fan only asking for a selfie. Glep is given some mixed messages during a table read, where he is told his signature spitting is toxic, despite the other staff loving it. Next, Charlie decides to give out a giant check to charity after being given the idea by his uncle. However, going cold turkey, Mr. Frog is very sickly and somehow cuts off a woman's hands with said check. Pim and Charlie question if they can even rehabilitate the celebrity when Charlie gives Mr. Frog sleeping pills from his uncle and puts him on Jimmy Fallon. Being the final nail in the coffin, as Mr. Frog says an unknown, unforgivable obscenity that leads him to be deplatformed and blacklisted. Gleb is finally rehearsing his watered-down, safe, and bland role, made that way by the executive from earlier. Just as the audience is complaining about the performance, Mr. Frog, Charlie, and Pim rush through the door to publicly apologize. The executive cuts Mr. Frog off, leading him to eat him and thunderous applause. Um, was that, was that me dying at fault, Charlie? With his career replenished, Mr. Frog decides to make a new show in his own home and own 100% of the profits. Another great episode full of laughs, but also some good satire of how people try to rework their career and the squandering of creativity in the field of television. Rimsaws. A disembodied announcer reveals a fifth smiling friend is in development and asks the audience to perform a text-based poll. Pim is eager to start the day and offers Charlie a nice bowl of delicious pim- Oh, those are worms. 
Anyway, Mr. Boss eagerly comes rushing in to answer the phone of a distressed client. Charlie and Pim head on over to the apartment of Shrimp, a reclusive... Shrimp, voiced by David Firth, who only spends his time playing Mouse Quest and longs to return to his girlfriend Shrimpina. Pim decides to split off after giving information on where Shrimpina works, meeting a woman at a cafe, and tells her to meet his secret admirer at a disco. Charlie decides to work with Shrimp on getting a new wardrobe, resulting in this now iconic frame. When clothes don't quite work, they go to a tanning salon, where Shrimp gets cooked and reveals a fear of confrontation, resulting in a trip to the gym, which similarly fails. While Pim is organizing the meeting, he starts to realize he has become infatuated with the woman he met, and decides to make it right by officially introducing Shrimp was the secret admirer. As it turns out, though, the woman's name is Jennifer, yet immediately falls in love with Shrimp for his love of Mouse Quest, putting a big ol' smile on his face. Pim is distraught at how he muddled the situation, only for Smormu to appear, as he apparently won by just a wipeout. By far the episode's biggest strength is David Firth's unique delivery as Shrimp, and the running point of Pim needing glasses is very true to life. Uh, Pim may seem a bit opportunistic, but it's, it's all in his head, and it shows a nice summation of what the character is all about. <laughs> Silly Halloween special. The whole office is celebrating Halloween, aside from Charlie, who worries that in ten years he may be chastised for his choice of costume. The boss comes in, telling the group that they don't have enough firewood for their yearly fire, and Pim, dressed as a cowboy, volunteers to search for firewood, but is told not to go past a rickety bridge for fear of getting lost. He finds plenty twigs, but feels he'll need some stronger material that is unfortunately on the other side of the aforementioned bridge. To ensure he doesn't get lost, Pim marks the trees he has been to only for the rain to wash away. As Pim stumbles through the forest, the daylight fades and a sense of terror is in the air. This foreboding nature is only exacerbated when a stop-motion forest demon reveals itself to Pim. Running for his life, Pim comes across an abandoned cabin and attempts to regain some positivity by imagining how he could live there for his later years. Whilst imagining the fanciful future, reality is crushed upon Pim as the creature circles the cabin. Pim manages to leave across the river via a small wooden boat, but is by no means out of the woods as the creature gives pursuit towards the headquarters. Pim successfully enters the building, with the monster halting the partygoers for its seemingly insensitive appearance. Please tell me that's not blackface. For its crime of potential hate, the attendants decide to dismember and disembowel the monster. Lastly, the creature is immolated while Mr. Boss congratulates Pim for indirecting, indirectly giving them the annual fire. <laughs> the framing bookends aid in this episode's atmosphere with a brilliant joke to close out. Even with its po focus being skewed more towards horror, the glimmers of humor are brilliant. The only flaw of this episode, which I don't even mind, is the arbitrary fact that it was aired 294 days prematurely. Who violently mucked up Simon S. Salty? Charlie and Pim have just left a movie and are craving some nourishment. The duo goes forth to Salty's, a notoriously unhealthy restaurant that has been heavily encouraged to change its menu. Cucumber Deluxe! When Charlie is greatly annoyed at his order being substituted, he asks to see Salty himself, where it is revealed that he was killed during his iconic 7 p.m. nap. Just as this is revealed, the duo is given the green light from Mr. Boss and the police force to investigate this mystery. They form together all the mascots, including, but not limited to, Crazy Cup, Mustard, the Fun Twins, Grace! The mascots are all funny or intriguing in some way, like how Crazy Cup is actually shaped like a cup, or Salt and Pepper being in a relationship. The two interview the Fun Twins after Mustard attempts to seduce Charlie. That's a sentence. After the Fun Twins relay a bizarre, incomprehensible yarn, they spit on Pim's arm, and he goes to get some ointment in Salty's office, where the duo find a secret room. Following the path, they encounter the Century Egg, who 
who explains that Salty has made numerous enemies and shackled him up in the basement where he keeps the recordings. In exchange for the information, the Century Egg asks that he be buried in the Gardens of China once the ordeal is over. They view the security footage in front of all the suspects to find that everyone really did attempt to unalive the man, but his actual cause of death was just a heart attack. The mascots mistakenly believe that they can all go free, and the episode ends with them rioting in the streets. The episode excels at the absurdest humor. Just to give an example, Charlie tells the Century Egg that they'll bury him in one of the most sarcastic tones possible. Though in the end credit scene, we find that Charlie kept his promise, only to dig him up when Pim says he's never tried a Century Egg. A good episode that holds itself together by taking place in one location. And on a brief tangent, does Pim and Charlie saying secret room give off regular show vibes to anyone else? Enchanted Force. It's a slow day at the office when two fairies fly in and announce that the princess of the Enchanted Forest cannot smile for her royal portrait. Pim is ecstatic to go, as he has dreamed of going on quests ever since he was a child. The merriment is interrupted when a witch steals Charlie's hat. She offers the duo a guess at which hand it is in, but cheats and takes them to her lair. Just as they are about to be cooked, a hobbit known as Mip saves the two and offers Charlie an elixir for his headache. When Charlie pulls out an ancient sword, he is branded a hero by many, and Mip sings of his great heroism as Pym sulks at being disregarded and sidelined. With an entire day of noble deeds done, Charlie calls it a night on the doorstep of the castle. Pim confronts Charlie about how he didn't get to do anything, causing Mip to run away to their campfire. In the throes of the flame, Mip attempts to seduce Charlie, but says he can deliver a package of his to the princess. After hours of stewing and jealousy, Pim tries to steal the box for himself, but Charlie accidentally backs Mip into a spike. Fading <laughs> the the duo solemnly delivers the package in honor of their fallen companion. When they mention Mip to the princess, she reveals that Mip would harass and stalk her, causing her to call smiling friends in the first place. The package itself ends up being a time bomb, which the princess defenestrates with just a second to spare. Despite the shift in tone, the episode overall serves as an important study of the character's flaws, with Mip working well as a villain subtly enough so as not to be too overtly predictable. I really love this one, especially for the fact of aliens aren't fantasy and such. Browning Friends As Pim and Charlie are awaiting a call, Charlie skims through an article that says the Renaissance men are coming to town. It may be an overused statement, but how does this sound more human than shows with actual humans? They're drawn outside where a company called Frowning Friends moves in across the street. When Mr. Boss is asked about this development, he simply says that it's healthy competition while smiling blankly. Pim decides to go out onto the streets to find customers as they happen upon DJ Spit, who yearns to be a SoundCloud artist. When Pim says that he can find an audience with practice, DJ Spit mentions that he was told to give up on his dreams that, by two people who look just like the duo. The two go on to the house of Mr. Man, who states that he was told to feel bad about his misshapen head, and threatens Pim and Charlie by morphing into DJ Spit. Moving to the park, the pair finds a distraught man known as 3D Squildon, who considers starting a balloon business. His smile vanishes as soon as it appears when Grim and Gnarly tell him that the Earth's helium will be depleted in as quickly as two decades. At the HQ. Mr. Boss has over Warren Buffett, Mr. Peanut, and Ronald Reagan. When Mr. Boss feels that the idea of a peanut jig will not help, he goes up to the attic and contemplates attacking his rival's building. Grimm is setting up a rally as Pim and Charlie arrive, and he claims the two are bullying him for his ideology. Two guards, Alan and Glepp, apprehend them just as Mr. Boss approaches the frowning friends with a loaded weapon. The fear causes Grimm to urinate in his pants, which his followers declare, Kinda cringe. Just as Mr. Boss consoles the business owner, 
Men from the medieval times on horseback arrived to destroy the two, with Charlie and Pim arguing over whether or not these were the previously mentioned Renaissance men. This episode is just a hilarious exploration of how the denizens of Smiling Friends operate. In addition, it's almost universally funny to see Mr. Boss going insane. DJ Spit will live on in our hearts. Charlie dies and doesn't come back. Pim is eager to set up the office's Christmas lights, despite the fact that it is December 24th. Charlie simply feels like going home when the boss asks the employees to go out and chop up a tree for the festivities. They go to the tree farm, and Pim believes that something is up with Charlie. Charlie simply, say, simply states that he doesn't want to be at work during Christmas Eve, and the two have a somewhat realistic argument about how Charlie feels Pim asks him to conform to positivity. Then Charlie sourly insists on chopping the tree, leading him to be crushed. He wakes up in hell, where he is promised forms of torture, until the cardboard facade is pulled back, and we learn that due to Satan's bad mood, H.E. Double Hockey Sticks has frozen over. Charlie stumbles upon his grandma, who, given directions to, on where to find Satan, he ventures through beautifully drawn and immaculately detailed set pieces when he arrives at Satan's abode. The lair is rife with empty cans, dirty clothes, and leftover food. Satan himself is hardly the horrific ruler of the underworld, as much as he is a stressed worker who ultimately decides to just stop caring. Charlie uses this opportunity to head back to Earth, but his critique of Satan prods at his insecurities and has Charlie tortured by the demonic beings and Jeremy. But because he finds joy in torture, Charlie is allowed to send to return to Earth with the help of Galbert Godfrey. During Charlie's funeral, we see everyone's reactions to the fact that Charlie may really be gone when he forms back alive like clay. Pym reconciles with his friend as the narrator from the beginning is revealed to be Glep. In all honesty, this is by far the most visually diverse of a visually diverse show, with the amount of seasonal and atmospheric backgrounds to comb through. Mr. Boss's speech is one for the Library of Congress, and Jeremy comforting the demons is always a lark. Rest in power, Gil Lord God Freed. The smiling friends go to Brazil. Eager to leave work behind for a while, the main four arrive at the Brazilian airport. Yet when Pim is asked which hotel they are staying at, he believes that it was someone else's job to find out, and they all decide to regroup at the airport bar. With the knowledge that Mardi Gras is taking place, they feel they don't have nearly enough money, and they ask if they should call Mr. Boss to aid financially. Being told of their situation, he suggests they simply go back home and plan another vacation. I can understand if some people are more mixed on this episode, but I appreciate how it takes the relatability of the show to a new level, and the animation is undeniably impressive given the long-take nature. This episode also finds its way into my vernacular with the Are You a Tourist? moment. Overall, I feel Smiling Friends is a show worthy of its acclaim and undeniably needs more episodes. Let me know what you thought of it in the comments below, and next video should be whatever I feel like.